Why don't we take a minute to pray? Can we do that? Can, can we just take a minute to pray? Father, here we are in the middle of the week. <clears throat> it's hard to believe it's already Wednesday and... Um, I know I'm in a room full of people that have got a lot going on, and we we do live incredibly busy lives, and I pray that we would make sure we have those respite moments with you where we're not rushing to the next thing or there's not an urgency about what we're doing, certainly not an urgency about our time with you, but that we would practice what you instruct us to do is to be still and to know that you are God and that you'll be exalted among the nations you'll be exalted in all the earth and I and I thank you for this concentrated time we have to work on the model prayer for us just to learn and observe more about prayer to put it into practice um, to grow in prayer to, to be more prayerful people people who passionately pursue you. And God, our, our hearts are heavy for what's going on in the Middle East right now. And we're deeply disturbed, deeply disturbed. And the scripture instructs us to pray for Israel and we do. We pray for peace in Israel. We pray for safety oh God I, it, it just hurts to think about what's happening there right now and um, mm, mm. We, we pray we pray for your name to be exalted in the midst of the chaos and for people to turn to you for the brothers and sisters who are there in Israel. For the pastors that we know of. For the students that we know of. For them to trust you and for them to pray and rely on you and cast their anxiety on you because you care for them. But we also pray for your name to be exalted and your glory to be revealed and for the men and the women and the boys and girls in that part of the world that are not born again for them to see and hear about you through the living witness of the brothers and sisters there to point them to you. As, as our dear pastor friend in Galilee asked, we pray that you would confuse the enemy, the Hezbollah and the Hamas and, the, and, the, and, the, and any of the other evil predators and terrorists that you would confuse them and blind them and then for Bibi Netanyahu for President Biden for Secretary of State Blinken for all of the the brain trust that's making decisions and providing support Oh God, there's got to be peace to come. And we pray for that peace. We labor in anguish over that. And for Lindsay and the death of her mom and for Ginger and the death of her sweet sister, Marsha. We know that you're near the brokenhearted and you save the crushed in spirit. And that you will minister to them through your Holy Spirit. Now, now, our God, give us instruction. Give us clear instruction. Give us, give us understanding on the next part of this beautiful, beautiful model prayer that you gave to your son to give to us. To your name be the glory and the power and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Listen to this commentary. Listen to this commentary on the Lord's Prayer from a book entitled Reflection on the Lord's Prayer by Zondervan Publishers. 
after having denounced showy and meaningless prayers, Christ introduced a splendid short prayer of his own. With it, he instructed us on how to pray and what we should pray for. He gave us a prayer that touches upon a variety of needs. By themselves, these needs should compel us to approach God daily with these few easily remembered words. Listen closely. No one can excuse himself by saying he doesn't know how to pray or what to pray for. No one can excuse himself by saying he doesn't know how to pray or what to pray for. The Lord's Prayer is the finest prayer that anyone could have ever thought up or that was ever sent from heaven because God the Father gave God the Son the words for the prayer and sent him to introduce it. And we know beyond a doubt that his prayer pleases the Father immensely. We know beyond a doubt that his prayer pleases the Father immensely. So let's open our Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. And let's work a little bit on the, on the, on the context. And Jesus is teaching his disciples about prayer. And he's teaching them how not to pray. And he's teaching them how to pray. And I want to note just 5, 6, 7, and 8. I want to note those verses right there. And, and I, want, I want to give the positive movement on those verses. Verse 5, Jesus says, When you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may see, be seen by others. Truly I say to you that they have received their reward. Their reward is the accolades they get for that prayer. My goodness, that was a beautiful prayer. That was a mighty prayer. That was, that, wow, how did you learn how to pray that? That's their reward. The, the positive bent to that is the Lord wants us to pray sincerely. The Lord wants us to pray sincerely. Look at verse 6. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Now you see the contrast. The showy prayer is rewarded by people. The sincere prayer is rewarded by the Father. And the positive movement on that is the Father wants us to pray secretly. The Father wants us to pray secretly. This is not a prohibition to public prayer. This is not a prohibition to public prayer. But what this is, is that when we come to the Father into intimacy of prayer... He wants us to come to him privately. And let me say this. Let me say this. Be anytime before you pray publicly, please pray privately. Please go to the Father privately before you lead in public prayer. And, and I, I will tell you, I've told you this before and I'll say it again and I say it without reservation. I literally think about and pray about what I'm going to lead you in prayer on on Sunday morning. That, that prayer becomes spontaneous at points. But most of the time when I stand up on Sunday morning to lead us in the pastoral prayer, I know what I'm going to pray about. There are those occasions where the Holy Spirit will inspire me spontaneously. But I've prayed privately before I lead you in prayer publicly. Third one. Verse 7, I think Jesus is telling us to pray thoughtfully. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they'll be heard for their many words. So I think there's some thoughtfulness that needs to go into our prayer. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. And then the last one, verse 8 we're, we're praying sincerely, we're praying secretly, we're praying thoughtfully. Pray confidently. And that is, do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. So, I know you know this prayer as the Lord's Prayer. I know you know it as the Lord's Prayer. And that, that's a good title for it. 
But I think a good subtitle for it <clears throat> would be the model prayer. I think a good subtitle would be the model prayer. And the reason is, <clears throat> I think Jesus is giving us an example. He's giving us a guide. He's giving us a road map. He's giving us an outline. And it's not that we pray this all the time, every time, and it's the only time we pray. He's just giving us a road map to prayer. For example, where we were last week, our Father in heaven. That's a very intimate expression that we use to call out to the God of creation, the sovereign God. And we said our Father always gives us his best. Our Father enjoys loving us. Our Father keeps his promises. Our Father's always available. Our Father can handle anything, and our Father's like no other father. All right, what follows after that are four words that we're going to look at tonight. And it's, it's the motif of his name. And you can note that this is the first petition, this is the first petition that Jesus makes in this modeled prayer. Let's break down those four words. Look at the first one, hallowed. Uh, literally means to separate, to consecrate, to sanctify. Perhaps you could say holy, to be holy. Here's a definition I like. To set something apart and acknowledge it as unique and valuable. To say, our Father, holy and separate and unique and distinct is your name. Look at the next word. B. This is not a declaration. This is a request. So when he says you pray our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, you're making a request, and the, and the request is your name. And when you, when you refer to God's name, you're referring to everything about God. You're referring to everything He is. All of His attributes, all of His character, all of His perfection, all of His sovereignty, everything about Him. So this is, this is the way Jesus is teaching us. Our Father in heaven, may your name be holy. Our Father in heaven, may, may your name be unique. May it be distinct. Let it be distinct. Okay, so... I know you may be wondering where I am in the notes, and I'm not even at the notes yet, but trust me, I'm going to get there. So, hallowed be your name involves two directives. And I don't know if I've got that in the notes or not. Do I, Buck? Let's go to the next slide and see. I appreciate KP doing this for me. Study my prayer. Keep going. Keep going. There we go. Before we get to that, stay right there, Buck. We're going to pray we treasure our Father's name above all the other names. So, we're asking God, when we say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, we're saying, God, help me treasure your name. Help me treasure your reputation. Help me treasure your beauty because it is above everything else. And we're asking that God's name be treated that way in heaven and on earth, that God be revered. So that's our lesson that we're working on tonight. Hang on one second, but let me, but, uh, Buck, let me say one more thing. So it simply is to say, Father, I, I want your name to be above all the other names, and then let me add this little second thought. It's not your notes. Let me add this. And we want, we want your name to be, we, we, want, we want your name to be treated as holy. That's what we're saying. John Piper says the most important prayer is that the most important person in the universe do the most important act in the universe. The most important prayer is that the most important person in the universe do the most important act in the universe, and it is to say that his name is honored, his name is glorified, his name is treasured, his name is revered. 
It is to say, our Father in heaven, please calls yourself to be treasured, honored, esteemed, praised, and worship. It is to say, calls your name to be regarded as holy. It is to say, would you let people see you for who you are? Would, would you bring ever-increasing honor to your name? Would you bring ever-increasing greatness to your name? So here we go. Half dozen lessons. What are they? Well, here's the first one. Father, may your name be renowned. When we say our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, we're saying we want your name to be renowned. In Exodus chapter 3, in Exodus chapter 3, Moses is asking clarification before he goes and stands before Pharaoh. Do you remember the episode? And Moses asked him a question. So let's go to Exodus chapter 3. And he says, hey, look, I know when I go stand before Pharaoh, Pharaoh's going to ask me, Pharaoh's going to ask me, who, who sent you? And who should I tell them sent me? What's your name? And look at what God said to Moses. God said to Moses in three, Exodus 3.14, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Okay, there's three distinctives about that statement. Three nuances. Here's the first one. When we say that God is, I am who I am, we're saying that God is self-existent. Meaning he, he is dependent on no one, he is dependent on nothing for his existence. It also means that he is the creator, the, and as the creator, he's the sustainer of all things. And then get this nuance, it also means he is immutable. And that's a great theological word describing his unchanging nature. Here's a great way to understand God's unchanging nature. Everything that God does is perfect. So if God loves us perfectly, here's a great way to understand it. If God loves us perfectly, there's nothing we can do to make God cause us to love us even more. And there's nothing we can do to make God cause us to love us even less. Because His love for us is perfect. It's unchanging. It's immutable. It remains the same. And so when God told him, He said, You tell them I am who I am. He is stating the most fun fundamental thing that can be said about God. And it is this. That He is. That he simply is. That he simply is God. That he simply exists. Let me run through some thoughts. That means he's eternal. That means he owes his existence to no one. That means there is no succession of events to describe him. That means he's independent of existence. He is not dependent on anyone or anything. In fact, everyone and everything is dependent on him. He's in, need, he's in need of nothing, and everything is in need of Him. That's what it means to say, Father, may your name be renowned. Second lesson. When we say, our Father in heaven, how be your name? We're saying, Father, may your name be worshipped. Let's go to Exodus 34. Let's just stay in the book of Exodus. Go to right to chapter 34. And, and, and this is when Moses is saying, hey, look, if you don't go with us, we're not going. We're sunk going into the promise. If you don't, if you don't go with us, there ain't no way we're going to make it. There's no way I'm going to lead these people. And that's when God hides Moses. I have to go through the context real quick. It's when God hides Moses in the cleft of the rock. And God passes by, and God gives us what, what has been called his first self-announcement. He's giving this self-revelation of himself. Verse 6 says, The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. The fact that Exodus 34 exists is proof that God is merciful. And this is why. This is the second time Moses is having a face-to-face -face encounter with God. Remember the first time? The first time God gives Moses the commands, Moses comes down from the mountain, and what are the people doing? 
They're, they're worshiping a golden calf. They threw all their jewelry into the melting pot and this golden calf came out and God asked them to obey him and they would be his possession, his people. But instead of valuing God, they became restless and they craved the value of their own workmanship. And this worship of a golden calf should have ended God's patience at that point. What they did is they exchanged the eternal glory of a self-existent God for their own glory, a golden calf. And so what happens is Moses throws down the commands. Remember, shatters them, heads back up the mountain, and this shows us how merciful God is. This is, this is one of the great expressions of God's mercy because if he was not merciful, he should have wiped them out right then. And he didn't. All right, look at the five, look at the five descriptions of how God should be worshipped. And then I'm going to try to describe something for you. Good luck. A God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. So here's what you're going to do. You're going to draw a triangle, or you're going to picture a triangle. And you're going to write a lot on that triangle. This is not original with me. In fact, if you ever do hear anything original from me, I'll give you a heads up and let you know. And you have yet to hear anything original from me. But I want you to draw a triangle. And I want you to come down to the base of that triangle. And my math teachers in the room are about to freak out right now. So just be patient with me, math teachers. And on both ends of the base of that triangle, on both ends, on either side of the base of that triangle, I, I want you to write the first statement that's made. And that is merciful and gracious. Write it over on one end of the triangle. And all the way over on the other end of the base of the triangle, I want you to write that last statement. Forgives iniquity and transgression and sin. So over here to the left side of the base, you write merciful and gracious. The right side of the base, you go all the way to the end, you write forgives iniquity and transgression and sin. So what is merciful? Merciful is God holding back what we deserve. And what is gracious? It's Him giving us what we do not deserve. So it's the, it's the symbiotic relationship of him, him holding back what we deserve and Him giving us what we do not deserve. That's merciful and gracious. Where He forgives our iniquity, our transgression, and our sin, it is that through Christ and through the blood and through the transforming power of His blood, He casts our sin as far as the east is from the west. He no longer notices it and He no longer holds it against us. So you got... Gracious and merciful in this end of the triangle, you got forgives. Forgive would be just a simple way to do it. Okay, now we're going to go up this part of the triangle right here. You with me? Halfway up the side. And on this side, you're going to write slow to anger on the left side. You're going to write slow to anger, which is the second statement that's made. And on this side, you're going to write keeps steadfast love. That's on the right side. So that's the fourth statement. So bottom, you got the first statement and the last statement. The two sides, you got the second statement and the fourth statement. And what does it mean when we say God is slow to anger? It means God is slow to anger. And what does it mean that he keeps steadfast love for thousands? that he guards his love for us, he preserves his love for us because he's slow to anger. Finally, the top of the triangle, right here in the middle, I want you to write the third statement, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. In this self-revelation that God makes, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness is the driving point. It is, it, is, it is the focal point. And he is saying this, I am merciful and gracious. I am forgiving of iniquity and transgression. I am slow to anger. 
I keep steadfast love to thousands because I abound in steadfast love and faithfulness. Does that make sense? It's a very descript way of looking at this self-revelation. And if you're trying to figure out how to say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. You're gracious and merciful. You're forgiving of transgression, iniquity, and sin. You're slow to anger. You keep steadfast love for thousands. Why? Because you're abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Go to Psalm 100. Go to Psalm 100. I'm going to show you why I love this psalm so much and why Benita Chandler loves it so much and why her daddy loved it so much. Look, look at all the directives in Psalm 100. All the things that we should do. Make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into His presence with singing. Know that, know that the Lord He is God. It is He who made us and we are His. We are His people, the sheep of His pasture. Enter His gates with thanksgiving. His courts of praise. Give thanks to Him and bless His name. One directive after another. Enter, praise, shout, bless. Verse 5 gives us why. Threefold. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever. And His faithfulness to all generations. That, that is what motivates us to worship Him. We're motivated to worship Him because He is good. His steadfast love endures forever. And His faithfulness to all generations. That's why we make a joyful noise. That's why we serve the Lord with gladness. That's why we come into His presence with singing. That's why we know His Lord. That's why we enter His gates and things. That's why we give thanks to Him. That's why He bless His name. Lesson three. When you're praying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, you're saying, may your name be renowned. May your name be worshipped. Here's the third one. May your name be obeyed. May your name be obeyed. In Leviticus chapter 22, verse 31 and 32, the Lord says, So you shall keep my commandments and do them. I am the Lord, for you shall not profane my holy name, that I may be sanctified among the people of Israel. The, the book of Leviticus is, without a doubt, one of the most incredibly difficult books to read and to study. You don't go to Leviticus for devotional purposes. Can I get an amen on that? But when you read it, you discover these little kernels of truth like in chapter 22, and it shows us how to love our Savior. And you shall not profane my holy name, that I may be sanctified among the people of Israel. So when we pray, hallowed be your name, we're praying, may your commandments be obeyed. May your commandments be kept. May we obey you. Here's a simple principle. We hallow God's name when we keep His commandments. We profane God's name when we break His commandments. Obedience is hallowing the name of God. Disobedience is profaning the name of God. One of, one of the ways that we look at it, one of the ways that we look at it, is that when we were regenerated, when we were born again, when God saved us, and, and He imputed, He infused, He imparted the righteousness of His Son, Jesus Christ, in us, we took on God's name. And we became Christ followers. We became Christians. Um, Stu Floyd knows of my love for coaches. I love coaches. Always have. Didn't necessarily love them when they were coaching me, but I loved them afterwards. I love them. And one of the guys that I think gets it, and he gets a bad rap, is Herm Edwards. Um, he had a, a football player years ago who was arrested, and it was a big public ordeal. And he went to that young man in jail to try to help him and get his life straightened out. And 
he finally used the football jersey to help that young man understand who he was. And he basically told him, young man's last name was Boykin. He said, the, last, the name on the back of your jersey is not yours. It's your family's. And whenever you do anything that is embarrassing or illegal or immoral, you're defaming the name on the back of your jersey. We, as children of God, carry the name of God with us everywhere we go. And whenever we do anything to profane His name, we're profaning the name that's on the back of our jersey. Like I said a few weeks ago, we are cross point. You remember that? Got to the end of the message and we said, we are cross point. And I said, hey, why don't we elevate it and say, we are Christ everywhere we go. Number four. Father, may your name be trusted. May your name be trusted. Numbers chapter 20. Verse 12, and the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not believe in me to uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land I have given them. So we're back to the nation of Israel. God's people are wandering in the wilderness and they're grumbling. And God told Moses to speak to the rock. And Moses' spirit was bitter. He speaks rashly and he beats the rock. And thus Moses did not believe God. And this is the instruction that God gives Moses. To hallow God's name means to believe him. It means to trust in him. It means to trust in what he says. Let me say it simply for us. God is not hallowed when we do not trust in him. We profane, if I can say it again, his name when we do not trust him. But we hallow his name when we trust him. And so when we say, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, it is to say, God, God, please cause your people, please cause us, please cause me, please cause my family, please call this, per calls this person I'm praying for to trust you. I want to trust you. I want your name to be hallowed. And I know that when you enable me to trust you, I'm hallowing your name. So let's talk about something for a moment. Let's talk about something for a moment. Let's talk about, and I got, I got my young parents in here. Let's talk about teaching our kids how to trust God. I, I'm going to give you two or three things that will never instill trust in your kids. This will never instill trust in your kids. And then we'll give you one thing that will. Here's the first one. You better, you better trust God or something bad's going to happen to you. That will not work. They will resist that. I'm going to tell you this, parents. Neither will they learn to trust God if you sit them down and you start trying to teach them this is how you trust God. And I'm going to tell you this. It's not even something you give them. Like, here, this is, this is trust. Here, take this, you carry this, and this is how you trust God. Here's the answer. Here's the answer to teaching your children how to trust God by your belief, by your behavior, by your example, by your model. That's how you do it. They can hear it, and they're not going to get it. They can read it, and they're not going to get it. When they see it, they get it. And they got to see it. And let me let you off the hook. Let me let you off the hook. It's okay to admit to your children that you're struggling with trusting God. In fact, you want to let them know that. You want to open the curtain and let them in behind the scenes and say, we are struggling right now with trusting God. We want you to know that. Because we're still going to trust him. I, I am blown away by the level of trust that my children have that far surpasses my level of trust. 
I'm blown away by that. And it's not by mine and Bonda's example. But what it is, is that when their faith started becoming their own, they started realizing how deeply they needed to trust God. And when they started realizing how deeply they needed to trust God, it just surpassed any kind of trust that we've ever had. I'll give you a classic example. And I'm not, I've never told this story. I don't think I have. Um, Taylor and Lydia were about to graduate from Beeson Divinity School. And um, they were already married. And uh, they wanted Vonda and I to, well, they came to the house for Sunday lunch. And they revealed to Vonda and me that they felt like the Lord was sending them to Germany to plant a church. It wasn't a total shock, but I don't know that we were there yet. We weren't where they were, that's for sure. And we did the parent thing, what about this, and what about that, and what about this, and what about that, and what about this, and what about that, and have you thought about this, and have you thought about that, and have you looked at this, have you looked at that? And, we find, and at some point, they just kind of gave up on answering our questions and they, you know, they were honest. We hadn't thought about that. We need to think about that. Well, we have, and this is what we're going to do. And then um, when they left, um, Bonda gave me a pretty good talking to. <laughs> and um, she said, you, you, you better help them get this figured out. That's a big step. That's crazy. We better make sure they know what they're doing. Well, I, I did what any good pastor would do. Um, I figured out how to, they could plant a church here in the United States. <laughs> and it was a great plan, if I must say so myself. And um, do what? <laughs> well, no, it was. That was the problem. It was my plan. And one night, there was a meeting at Shades Mountain Baptist Church, and some of these people will remain nameless, but... Um, Taylor and I went to that meeting, and afterwards, or as it was meeting was coming to the end, there was a bunch of people there. I said, hey, Taylor, there's some people here that want to talk to you for a minute. They're real curious about your and Lydia's desire to plant a church. And we go in the room, and there was Kevin Ezel, the executive director of the North American Mission Board, and there was Danny Wood, the pastor of Shays Mountain Baptist, and there was Buddy Gray, the pastor of Hunter Street, and there was um, a representative for Rick Lance of the Alabama Baptist Convention, and there was... John Tweet, Pastor First Baptist. There were a lot of people in that room. And so they gave them a plan. And they said, here are four places in the United States where we think you can plant a church and we will underwrite your effort for 10 years. And I'm thinking, oh, glory, son, you got to say yes to this right now. This is, no one else is getting this right now. No one else is getting this. I didn't manipulate all that. The God had some to do with it. But I'm serious, don't... <laughs> I really think, well, I'll tell you how God was in it. I'm going to tell you how God was in it. And I remember sitting there listening to him present it, and I'm thinking, oh, my goodness, if I was at that time 20-something years old, I would say yes to this in a heartbeat. And Taylor was very, yeah, well, thank you. That's great. It's wonderful. And so we get in his little truck that he had, and we're driving back to his house where my car is parked. And my son says, think about how intimidating this was for him. He said, Dad, I don't think you understand. God has not put it in our heart to plant a church in America. He's put it in our heart to plant a church in Europe. And that's a great plan, and we appreciate all those people and all the resources they have to provide. But Lydia and I are going to Europe. And I thought, oh, man, your mom is not going to like this. <laughs> and I said, here it is. I said, son, you don't know anyone in Europe. And my son says, God does. And about 60 days later, my son calls me and asks me if I know who David Parker is. And I said, I know of him, but I don't know him. And he said, well, he's in Germany and he's flying to Atlanta next week, and he wants to talk to Lydia and me about coming to Germany to plant a church. 
I washed my hands. I said, go, go. I got in the way. I don't, I don't have the kind of faith my kids have. I don't have that kind of trust. And I've seen God do that over and over and over and over and over and over again to the point where, and my daughter has done the same thing, but my son primarily has said, don't you want us to trust God? Yeah. To clarify and we'll move on. I don't think Taylor and Kelsey learned to trust God because of mine and Vonda's great trust. I think they learned to trust God because of mine and Vonda's struggle to trust God. And we were very transparent about it. And this is very hard. And we're not sure how God's going to do this. But we're going to wait and see what he does. Move on. Number five. Father, may your name be feared. May your name be feared. That's another way of saying hallowed be your name. Listen to what God warns Isaiah about. He's, he's warning Isaiah, don't you, be, don't you be like Israel. Don't you be like the people. Verse 12 of Isaiah 8, Do not call conspiracy all that this people calls conspiracy. And do not fear what they fear, nor be in dread. But the Lord of hosts, Him you shall honor as holy. Let Him be your fear, and let Him be your dread. You, you hallow God's name, not by fearing what men fear, you hallow God's name by fearing God. You, you do not fear displeasing men. Instead, you fear displeasing God. You do not fear rejecting men or being rejected by men. You fear rejecting God. This is a dangerous place. This is a dangerous place when you say no to His commands, no to His promises, no to His will, let me just give you this warning and write this. Warning, warning. Never say no to God. Do not say no to God. Your fear for Him should be so great that you could never say no to Him. Hallow God's name by fearing Him. Hallow God's name by not fearing what man fears. You do not fear displeasing man. Instead, you fear displeasing God. Let me ask you this question. Write this question down. What do you dread more? What do you dread more? Disappointing others or disappointing God? What do you dread more? Number six. We're done. Number six. Father, may your name be multiplied. Father, may your name be multiplied. Deuteronomy 32.3 says, For I will proclaim the name of the Lord and ascribe greatness to our God. This, this prayer is not only over us. This prayer should be prayed all over the world, all over the nations, all over the tribes, all over the nationalities. We should pray for God's name to be multiplied. We should pray for God's great gospel to go into all the world. And this is what happens. When we hallow God's name, when we hallow God's name, we tell others about Jesus. When we hallow God's name, his witness is multiplied. We hallow God's name by testifying to His grace. We hallow God's name by testifying to His goodness. We hallow God's name by taking the gospel to the world. And we should pray for His name, His greatness, His glory, His grace, all of that to be multiplied in all the earth. That should be our prayer. Isaiah 26, 8, write that reference down, says, Your name and remembrance are the desire of my soul. Your name and remembrance of the, that is my desire for you to be multiplied. Now let's just pause for a minute and let's talk about something that's really difficult. And I've asked, I've asked countless pastors, I've asked countless pastors. 
And, and it's interesting, all of those guys just kind of keep settling on the same one or two, three thoughts. I want to help you. How do you pray for Israel right now? How do, and, and you all know me well enough, I, I'm not into the... I'm, I'm not in... Uh, I'm praying for Jesus to come, but I'm not really worried about all the prophecy stuff. That, just, that never has been a focus of mine. And, and, I, and I, I can't tell you if this has anything to do with end times. I can when it's all over with. I go, yeah, well, that was it. Right there. But I'm, I just, that just, it, it, it's never appealed to me. And I'll tell you why it's never appealed to me. Because it's so stinking confusing. And another reason why it's never appealed to me is there's about three major camps. And I think all three major camps are right in one way or another. And so I've, I've been asking pastors, I've asked the Lord, how do, how do we pray about this? How do we pray about this? Let's think of five or six things to pray for. Let's think of five or six things to pray for. I, I, I think what the pastor from Galilee t- told Buck last weekend, let's pray for the enemy to be confused. That's a great prayer. For the enemy to be confused, for them to be blinded. Let's pray for peace to be upon Israel. The, the Bible says that repeatedly, Psalm 125 in particular. Um, let's pray for the safety of the innocent civilians who are being, it's, it's just terrible. We just need to pray for their safety. Let's pray for the end of this conflict to come. Let's, let's, let's just say, God, bring this to an end. But you know, you know as well as I do, we live in an insanely evil world and we live in such a world that there are people who will not be satisfied until the last Jew on this planet is dead. Just look at human history. And you have one example of another where people have tried to wipe out the nation of Israel. And even today, the, the ire that people have for Jews is just sickening. There was two more I was going to mention. Oh, that God's name would be multiplied. That God's name would be exalted. That, that people would turn to the one true God. The holy triune God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And then, here's another one. That there would be people there in that part of the world to point them to the one true God. Like Omar, who's there studying the Hebrew language. Like the dear pastors that we're helping in Galilee. Like so many others that are there as witnesses for Christ. That that the brother... Here's another one. That the brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters, children of God, in that part of the world would trust God. So at the end of the day, after talking to a dozen pastors, and at the end of the day, after reading so many articles and listening to at least two podcasts and don't ask me what those podcasts are because I'm not going to remember them but at the end of the day what we pray for Israel should be just very very simple there's no need to make it complicated and then and then for your sake quit trying to figure out where this falls in Bible in biblical history just quit trying to figure that out you're not going to figure it out And and I'm going to say something that's a little bit mean here, but it's true. Anybody who's real confident on where this is in Bible history does not know what they're talking about. They don't. They're clueless. And if they're saying, oh yeah, this is 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 happening because of this. It is rumors of wars and wars and it's all that. I get that. I get that. But anybody who goes, oh yeah, and then the next thing that's going to happen is this, and the next thing that's going to happen is this, and then they're going to do this, and then they're going to build that, and then they're going to offer this, and they're going to do that... They're wrong. They're wrong. They're wrong. Does that help? Thank you, Clyde. I hope you were praying for me while I was going off on that right there. (laughs) Here's a great conclusion. Here's a great conclusion to God being renowned. God created the world, and He created us to serve Him and to enjoy Him, and to enjoy His creation, and to glorify Him. But we turned away from serving Him, 
We turned away from glorifying Him. And our original parents sinned and disobeyed God and marred themselves and subsequently marred all of us and marred creation. Nevertheless, God promised not to abandon them. And that was His perfect right. But to rescue them despite the guilt and the condemnation they were under and despite the flawed hearts and their character. And to do this, God called out one family in the world to know Him and serve Him. And that one family grew into a great nation. And He entered into a personal binding covenant relationship with them. And He gave them His laws to guide them. He promised His blessings if they obeyed Him. He gave them a system of offerings and sacrifices to deal with their sins and failures. However, because of human nature, because of sin... They failed him. And despite all these privileges and centuries of God's patience, even as God's people who received the law, the promises, and the sacrifices, they turned away from him. And it looked hopeless for the human race. But then, all within his divine plan, through the progenitor Abraham and through the nation of Israel, God sent a Messiah who became flesh, who entered the world of time, space, and history. He lived a perfect life. And then he went to the cross to die, to die in our place, to die for our sins. For our sake, he made him who knew no sin to become sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And when he raised him from the dead, it was revealed that he had come to fulfill the law with his perfect life, to offer the final sacrifice, to take the curse we deserve, and thereby securing the promise of blessing for us by his free grace. And now to those who believe in him, we are united with God despite our sin. And this changes the people of God from a single nation state into this new and glorious, international, multi-ethnic fellowship of believers from every tribe and nation and language and people and culture. And we now serve Him and our neighbor as we wait for the blessed hope of Jesus to return and renew all creation and sweep away death and suffering. May His name be hallowed. Oh God, I, I thank you for these, um, these, these, these little moments, these little quiet times that you occasionally give us as a church where we slow down and we listen and we learn and we study and we think and we grow. And may, may this model prayer just kind of keep bubbling up within us. And may we, may we get real comfortable with understanding our Father in heaven hallowed be your name. I want to trust you. I want to obey you. I want you to be glorified among the nations. And not only do I want me to do that, I want others to do that, other children of yours to do that across the globe. Hallowed be your name. In your son's good name we pray. Amen.